We are in a message series, a little three-part series called Enough is Enough. And we're talking about contentment and gratitude, about contentment and gratitude. Anybody in here like to wait? Anybody? Anybody just like to wait? You like, like to wait on stuff like you love going to DMV and waiting in line? Anybody? It's Christmas season, so kids, you guys are, are in the practice of waiting right now. Parents, I don't know if kids still do this this way, but do they like text y'all Christmas lists? Like, how does this work now? Because when my kids were younger, they sat down with whole notebooks, y'all, like a whole notebook and like literally going through the Toys R Us catalog and writing everything down. I'm like, just hand me the Toys R Us book. Why do you need to write it all down? But that's how they did it. And then they would wait expectantly for Christmas to come. Some of y'all were waiting the other night. Y'all were waiting for Iron Mike to come back in, in this fight. And then you were waiting on Netflix to stop freezing. And, and let me tell y'all something. Like, I'm 47, right? So I have mad respect for this man that's 58 and got in a boxing ring because I hurt if I sleep wrong. So the fact that he could get in a boxing ring and fight, I'm like, hey, even though he lost, it's all good. He's, he's aluminum foil Mike now, not Iron Mike, but it's okay. It's all good. I love Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, if you watch this, I didn't mean any harm, brother. Please don't hit me. <laughs> I ain't going to front. I'm scared. <laughs> oh, man. But do we like to wait? Does anybody ever really like to just sit and wait? We can't stand it, right? We're so impatient. We're so used to instant gratification. We want what we want, when we want, how we want it. We don't know how to wait anymore. I was thinking as I was preparing for this message, because our topic today is waiting contently. That's what we're going to be talking about, waiting Contently, and I was thinking about as, as we were preparing for this message, I'm old enough to remember the days before internet, and then I'm old enough to remember when dial up started and they would mail you a disk, AOL would mail you a little disk in the mail, and you'd have to install it on your computer. And, and young people, like, y'all hear me out on this. Like, when y'all go to a website, it pops up right away. Like, we would, I would go to ESPN.com to check the scores from the game the night before. And so you go to log in and it makes this gong, 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 gong. Like, you have to listen to this noise for five minutes. And you type in ESPN.com and you hit enter and then you get up and you go take a shower. You start getting ready for work. You eat your breakfast. You come back. And by the time you get back, the scores are there. And you're like, all right, I got the scores. And then I thought to myself, at that time, that was cool. If that happened today... I'm on the phone with Verizon, Spectrum, whoever I need to talk to because my internet's too slow. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait at all. So again, today we're going to talk about waiting contently. If you have your phone with you, you can scan this QR code that's about to be up on the screen. It will take you to the notes for today's message so you can follow along. If you have the Seven Cities Church app, you can follow along there. And all of the scriptures from today will be on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. Now, to start today's message off, since we're talking about waiting, I have a verse that I want you guys to, to look at and maybe part of it try to memorize for yourselves. It's found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is an Old Testament prophet, and it's Isaiah 40, 31 is the verse I'd like for you to memorize, but we're going to start in verse 30. It says, even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, church, I think oftentimes the problem that we face is that when we wait, we try to wait in our own strength. We're waiting for our own outcomes to happen in our own timing. We're not really waiting on the Lord. And so we wonder why we struggle in the waiting so much. Now, today we're going to spend the most of our time in the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's a New Testament letter that the Apostle Paul wrote we're going to spend most of our time in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because I believe Paul gives us some building blocks for being able to have contentment while we wait. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But I want to give you a little bit of context on what we're about to read. 1 Thessalonians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica. The church in Thessalonica, Paul founded on his second missionary journey. So if you read in the book of Acts chapter 17, you will see where, where Paul found Founds, finds this church in Thessalonica. It says that for three weeks in a row, he went on their Sabbath day to teach in their synagogue. And as he's teaching, some of the Jews start to follow this message he was teaching. There were also some Greeks who followed and some prominent women who were there who said, we are going to follow this message that Paul is laying out. But it says that a lot of the Jews just kind of walked away from it. 
And so while Paul is there, he's staying with this man named Jason. And the people in the town began to get so upset, they actually say these people who are turning the world upside down are here and they are causing a ruckus. And so they go to arrest Paul, but Paul is not at Jason's house. So they pull Jason out into the streets and take him before the magistrates. And the people have to send Paul and Silas out another way so that they have to escape the city. And so this is the church that Paul is writing back to in this moment. And the reason that Paul writes this letter to them is that he wants to comfort them. They have lost some loved ones. They have lost some people that were close to them. And they have these questions about what's going to happen to these loved ones that we've lost. What's going to happen to these people? Are we ever going to see them again? We are waiting anxiously for Jesus to come. We are expecting Jesus to return. What's going to happen to our loved ones who have died before he returns? Because for a lot of people in the early church, they didn't think the return of Jesus was this far off thing. They often talked about it like Jesus is going to come back in a few weeks and we just have to be ready. Now, I know for them, they probably wished that that was the case because a lot of them faced trial and tribulation and turmoil and things that you and I can't even imagine, which is why I gave thanks that we're able to come and worship freely because they faced persecution like you and I can't believe. But they find themselves in this place where they are waiting. They are waiting, expecting the return of the Lord. They are waiting for his coming. They are hoping they have not missed it. And Paul is teaching them how to wait contently. So we're going to pick up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 12. So if you do have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. And again, if not, you can follow along on the screen. Or if you're in the notes, There should be a hyperlink for this passage. You can click and you can read along there. I will be reading from the ESV translation if you are using an app on your phone. But this is the Apostle Paul talking here. We're going to start in verse 12. He says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So he's talking here. He's giving them an urge. He says, There are some people in your church. Because remember, this is a fairly new church that that Paul has established. And there are some people in your church that are there to labor among you. They are working. They are bringing you God's word. They are delivering this word to you and they are admonishing you, which means they're correcting you and keeping you on the right path. He says, I want you to respect those that labor among you. And then in verse 13, he says, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And so what he's talking about in our context, and no, this is not just for me to say just because this benefits me in a sense, but what he's talking about in our context is that to respect the elders of the church, to respect those who are laboring among you, delivering God's word, students, for you guys to respect Caleb and the team that works with him, to preach to you each and every week, to bring you God's word, kids, little kids who are in here, to respect Miss Laura and the team that are teaching you God's word, that are teaching you to be faithful to God, to respect those people that God has put among you, to bring you his word, to teach you how to follow him and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. He then says to be at peace among yourselves. So he's talking to us, body of Christ. He's talking to us to say, be at peace among yourselves. Don't allow yourselves to be separated or divided by whatever the world wants to separate or divide by, but be willing to be at peace among yourselves. And the reason that he's challenging us with that is because our unity in Christ should be paramount over everything else. Our unity in Christ, our, our, our shared love for Jesus, our shared following of him is what binds us together tighter than anything else in this world. So be at peace among yourselves. He then goes on in verse 14 to say, and we urge you. So again, he's urging them, brothers, admonish the idol. So those of you who are saved, those of you who are following Jesus, you were not saved just for salvation's sake. You were saved for a purpose that God says in Ephesians chapter 2 that he prepared beforehand that you should walk in it. So what he's saying here is that if you are following Jesus, you cannot just be idle. There is a plan and a purpose. There is a work for you to do that God has prepared for you to do. And you need to step into it. Now, that work may look different for each of us, but we each have a work to do. He says, so don't be idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Maybe you're in here and you're like, Pastor Jay, I am following Jesus, but I'm just going through some things in life right now that that have me feeling a little oppressed, that have me feeling beaten down. Maybe I'm dealing with a sickness. Maybe it's something going on in my family. There's something that's just come against me that has me faint hearted. I feel weary. I feel like I'm about to faint. 
He says we are to encourage you if that's your case. And he says to help the weak. And when I read help, to we- help the weak, I think about this story that's told in the Gospels about Jesus, where he's in this house and, and people are trying to get to Jesus because they hear that he's able to do miracles. They hear that he's able to heal people. They hear that he's teaching this word that makes sense to them. They say that he speaks as one who has authority. And so there's this group of guys that have this friend and he's lame. He can't walk. He can't move. And these friends are so desperate to get this guy to Jesus that they climb up on the roof of the house and they tear open the roof of the house and they lower their friend down so that he can have an encounter with Jesus and receive the healing that he needs. That's what comes to mind when I read Help the Week, that we need to lift one another up, that we need to be bringing one another before Jesus Because he's the answer. He's the solution. He's the one that can fix the things that we face. And so we shouldn't be trying to fix these things for other people. We should be bringing people to Jesus. And so that's the picture I have of help the weak. Then he says, be patient with them all. How many of you would consider yourself patient? Anybody? Y'all some liars. Put your hands down. I know y'all. Y'all ain't patient. I done seen, I saw how you talk to your kids in the lobby. I seen how you drive into the parking lot. I'm just kidding. I can tell you, you can put your hand back up if you believe you're patient. There you go. Amen. My brother said he like Job. He got all the patience. Be careful what you say because God might test it. So anyway, <laughs> I don't ever pray for patience because there's only one way you get that. And that's, you know, you get stuck behind every idiot in traffic. You end up at DMV. You got to go through all the stuff. So don't ever pray for patience. Pray for strength. Pray for wisdom. Pray for all the other things. But Lord, just, whoo, I'm good on patience, Jesus. Anyway, he says, be patient with them all. And this one's hard for us. And I think patience and contentment go together. And so oftentimes when we feel discontent, it's because we really struggle with patience. We struggle with it. Again, we want things when we want them, how we want them, and where we want them. And when the Lord says, wait, we don't like that response. Sometimes we seek the Lord and he says, wait, and we take that as a no. And so we get mad with God. But God is saying, I need you to stand firm. I need you to be steadfast. I need you to be patient and to be patient with the people around you. And see, church, this is something we really have to understand, the importance of patience in our unity. Because anytime you step into a setting like this where you have people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic statuses, like we're all different in terms of where we come from, who we are, and the things that we've done. But God has brought us all together And when he brings us all together, this requires patience because we're not going to see the world the same way. We're not, we haven't experienced the world the same way. And if we lose our patience for one another, what happens is disunity. But I have to understand that, that just because I've experienced life one way, maybe you haven't. And what we have to do is we have to grow in grace for one another and we have to be moved with compassion for one another Remember, we talked about that in our last series, biblical compassion, that deep empathy for one another that says, I may not understand it, I may not have experienced it, but let me be willing to put myself in your shoes and feel what you're feeling. We have to be willing to do that for one another because that's what maintains unity in the body of Christ. And when we are unwilling to do that, what happens is we begin to create disunity because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make everyone else like us. It's not my job to make you like me. It's my job to model to you what it looks like to be like Jesus. And so what we're trying to do is we're allowing the Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of Christ. I don't want 150 J's running around. (laughs) You have to laugh like that. But that's (laughs) that's not what I want, though, right? Well, I need more patience. (laughs) What I want is 150 little models of Jesus running around. That's what the world needs. The world doesn't need more J's. The world needs more Jesus. And so if we're going to take Jesus to the world around us, we have to be conformed to his image. That happens when we come together as the body of Christ and give one another enough grace to grow in Christ so that we can then take Christ out to the world around us. But we have to be patient with one another to do that. He says here, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil. That's hard. Because human nature says, you did me wrong, so now I'm not going to feel right until I do you wrong. And we want to repay evil for evil. But he says, see that no one does that. But always seek to do good to one another 
and everyone. Let me repeat that. Always seek to do good to one another and everyone. Everyone that doesn't look like you, act like you, think like you, vote like you, live like you, we need to seek to do good to them, not seek to do them harm. He's told us to stay away from that, right? To stay away from doing them harm. And then he goes into verse 16 and he says this. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. And so I have a question for you today, and we're going to take this question to kind of shape the rest of this message and break down those verses that we just read. And the question is, how can you and I find contentment in our waiting? Because we've already admitted that we don't really like to wait. And so if we don't like to wait, we're going to struggle to find contentment while we're waiting on the Lord. We're going to struggle to find contentment while we're waiting for God to come through. Many of us are facing things in life that we have prayed and we've sought God about. And we're saying, Lord, please answer me. And his answer isn't no. His answer has just been wait. But we struggle to have contentment in that. And so I believe that the Apostle Paul gives us some building blocks in that last, those last few passages that we can use to find contentment while we wait. And the first building block he gave us was this, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Now, I hear that and I think to myself, that's really difficult to do. My natural response, and I'm just going to speak for me, I'm not going to speak for the rest of y'all. My natural response when difficulty comes, my, thought of, my mind immediately goes to, I'm about to complain about this. And I have to tell my mind to be quiet. I have to tell my mind, you're not going to complain Like God has a purpose in this. You need to find a way to rejoice in the midst of this. And we should not miss the fact that it's the Apostle Paul telling us to do this. So I mentioned Acts chapter 17 before because that's where we encounter the church at Thessalonica. That's where we encounter Paul on his missionary journey planting this church. But Acts chapter 16 talks about another church that Paul planted. It's the church in Philippi. He wrote a letter to that church as well, the book of Philippians. But it was in Philippi where Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in jail. And there's this story that they were beaten so bad that they despaired of life. But instead of complaining while they were in jail, they began to sing praises. And while they were singing praises, God sent an angel and the angel made the shackles come off their feet. The doors to the jail opened and the jailer was about to kill himself because in Roman culture, If the jailer let the prisoners escape, he would be killed. And so in his mind, he's like, I'm just going to kill myself because these people have gotten away. And Paul cries out to him, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. And so then the jailer comes to them and says, what must I do to be saved? Like, how can I be converted? And so the jailer turns to faith in Christ. And so this same Paul who was beaten unjustly and thrown into prison wrote a whole letter in the book of Philippians telling people to rejoice, and now he's telling the church in Thessalonica the same thing. Rejoice always. And I share that story with you about Paul just to say, I don't know what you're facing in life. I don't know what hardship you have. I don't know what diagnosis you got from the doctor. I don't know the things that you are encountering on a daily basis. But I do know that we serve a God who's bigger than anything we can face so that we can rejoice always no matter what comes our way. We can always find a reason to have joy. Because joy is not based on our circumstances, it's based on who we serve, right? And so you can always find a reason to rejoice, but you have to do just that. You have to make a choice and find a reason to rejoice. So you can rejoice always. The second building block he gives us is to pray without ceasing. And this is one That, again, some of this stuff I struggle with personally, and so, like, I'm thinking about this. How do I pray without ceasing? Because without ceasing means to not stop. And so I had to ask myself some questions. Do I pray without ceasing? What this really means is to be in constant communication with the Father. And so am I constantly communicating with the Father? Now, Paul's not saying that you need to walk around and pray out loud every single moment of every day. That's not what he's telling you. But he's telling you that if you're going to be content while you wait, if you're going to have a relationship with the Father, you need to be in such constant communication with him 
that you are always going to him for the things that you need, that you're always going to him for the things that you need to inquire about. And so what this looks like for you and me is that I'm not going to make decisions without inquiring of the Lord first. There's this story in in Scripture, and forgive me because this just came to me, but I don't remember exactly where it is, but there's this story in Scripture about King David, and this army comes in, and they, they basically take all of his stuff. They take his wives, they take his men's wives, they take all of their possessions, and they go run off. And my natural response the first time I read that story was like, oh, we're about to go after them. I'm about to call up my boys. We're going to get the posse together. We're going to go like, we're going to go after them. We're going to get our stuff back. David didn't do that. It said that David inquired of the Lord, that he went to the Lord and said, Lord, can I go after them? He sought God's permission. In the midst of something that you and I would probably look at and say, I already know what the answer is. He sought the Lord's permission. And the Lord told him, you may go. And so he went and he got all of his things back and they recovered their wives and their children. They got all of their stuff back. But even in the midst of a circumstance where we would look at it and say, David was done completely wrong and he had every right to, to make it right himself. He sought the Lord in the midst of it. Are we seeking God in the midst of the situations and circumstances in our life or are we responding emotionally? Are we seeking God or are we responding from our understanding? Because I can tell you this, church, oftentimes when we respond in our emotions and we respond in our understanding, that leads to more trouble. But when we seek the Lord, when we take a moment to pause and pray without ceasing, when we take a moment to pause and say, hey, Lord, this is what I'm facing. And I know that you see all things, you know all things, that you have all things in your hand. What do you want me to do in this situation? And just inquire of him. That's how we commune with the Father day in and day out. We make him a part of our everyday life. And I'm not saying you you need to wake up tomorrow and be like, okay, Lord, should I eat Fruit Loops or Apple Jacks? Now, if you want to, you can. He might have an answer for you. But I am saying that, that we need to go to him in life, go to him with the things that we face, go to him with the questions that we have, because we understand that he's a loving heavenly Father who wants to commune with us. He wants to walk with us. So we pray without ceasing. The third one kind of ties into the first one, but it's give thanks in all circumstances. So rejoice always, having joy in the midst of circumstances. Joy is not circumstantial. It's not based on your circumstances. But this idea of giving thanks, he is tying it to your circumstances. Because giving thanks is hard when you're in the midst of something difficult. I was thinking about this yesterday. Went to... um, a memorial service for a young man that died way too early. He was in his mid-20s. He was talking to his father in the lobby. And the father said to me, he said, if one person gets saved because of this, then I will look back and say it's all been worth it. And I thought to myself, that is such a testimony of how we can give thanks in all circumstances. That's such a testimony of how you and I can have a right perspective in the midst of something that seems tragic. And I share that, church, not, not, I share that with you because I want you to understand that there is a perspective that you can take on the hard things in your life that will still glorify and honor God in the midst of the tragedy that you face. We don't have to go through every tragedy with hopelessness. We don't have to go through tragedy with complaining. We don't have to go through tragedy and lose our joy. We can still maintain a perspective that keeps our focus on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We can maintain a perspective like Jesus and keep our eyes on the prize. But when we remove our eyes from him and we put our eyes back on us, that's when joy is far away. When you put your eyes back on you and on your problems, that's when hope and peace go out the door. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, that's when those things are present with you and you can have joy in the midst of your circumstances. You can have peace in the midst of chaos. You can have hope when everyone around you is hopeless because your eyes are on the author of hope. Your eyes are on the author of faith. Your eyes are on the author of joy. They're not on your problems. And if we're ever going to give thanks in all circumstances, we've got to stop giving so much power to our problems. Because that's what we do. We have a bad situation, and we start to feel hopeless because we think the problem is more powerful than our God. We get a bad diagnosis, and we start to feel hopeless because we think the diagnosis is more powerful than our God. We have bad finances, and we start to get hopeless because we think our financial problems are bigger than our God. 
And hear me clearly on this, church. I'm not saying that what you go through is not difficult. By all means, I get it. It's difficult. But what I'm saying is that your God is so much bigger than all of it. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live in fear. You can live in faith-filled hope because you understand that you serve the author who is bigger than all of those things. And so you can give thanks in the midst of those circumstances. The fourth thing that Paul says here is do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. And so when I, when I read that, when I, my immediate thought was, I wonder if people really know what that means. Because it's not a phrase that we hear used in church often anymore. Now, I grew up in a, in a Pentecostal church, so we heard it a lot. Y'all, don't, don't you quench the spirit in here now. Ooh, right? I heard it a lot. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. But it's not a, it's not a phrase that we use very often in church anymore. And so I don't know that people really fully understand what it means. And so to help you understand this, I'm going to paint it to you in, in this kind of picture. If you've ever been thirsty... If you've ever been thirsty, then you know what it feels like to quench your thirst. You know what it feels like to get that water that you need that makes that thirst go away. But that thirst is telling you something. That thirst is activating something in you. That thirst is letting you know that there's something deficient in you. And you need whatever it is that's going to quench that thirst. When the Spirit is working in you, When the Spirit is moving in you, when He's activating something in you, letting you know that you are deficient in something, and you do everything you can to push away from His work in your life, that's how you quench the Holy Spirit. When you spend all of your time trying to resist Him instead of trying to move in step with Him, that's how you quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy, I've often heard it described this way, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to use you like a puppet. He's going to impress things on your heart. He's going to try to lead you. But when you are constantly resisting him, that's how you quench him. It's almost like this, as a parent, have you ever had that moment where your kid is just trying to do something and you know it's going to lead to something bad, but they're just resisting you and finally you just throw up your hands and say, like, have your way. One of my kids, when they were younger, they were swinging between the arms of of two chairs And I told him, like, hey, bud, you need to stop. You're going to get hurt. And my wife was like, hey, you need to stop. You're going to get hurt. And he didn't listen. And then he fell and he bust his nose and he got up and his nose was all red. And I was like, I try to tell you, brother. (laughs) I have no sympathy in this moment because I tried to warn you. Now, my wife was mad because she had sympathy. But it's like, why you let him fall? I, I didn't let him fall. He let himself fall. But anyway, but that's what we do to God oftentimes. You will be moving in a direction and you will feel the Holy Spirit of God inside of you tugging at you saying, don't go that way. You will be in a relationship and you will feel the Holy Spirit of God inside of you say that this is wrong, that the things that you're doing are are wrong. You will feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you begin to resist that in such a way that eventually you quench it. And so you no longer hear the Holy Spirit telling you that what you're doing is wrong. You no longer feel that conviction, your heart has become hardened and you have quenched the Spirit's work in your life. He's saying, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Submit to his work. Submit to what he's doing in you so that you can be conformed to the image of Christ. Don't resist his work in your life. The next one he gives is, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Again, This is something that we don't really talk about a lot in church anymore, but because of my charismatic background, (laughs) I've experienced some things that will let me explain this a little bit better. Anytime someone comes to you and says, I have a word from the Lord for you, or God just told me to share something with you, I'm not saying those things don't happen, but what I will say to you is that every word that you hear out of anyone's mouth that they claim is from the Lord had better line up with his word or it is not from the Lord. Let me say that again. Everything that you hear, whether online or or from a friend or from your grandmama, your mama, I don't care who it is, or from a preacher, myself included, everything that you hear that somebody says is from the Lord, if it does not line up with his word, it is not from the Lord and you need to run from it. All right? Because God's word never returns void. His word will never return void and God will never contradict himself. So that's why Paul says test everything. This is your proof text. This is what you tested against. And if you can't find somewhere in here where that word lines up with, then you know it's bad. I've had people say, 
Not to me, but I've had people tell me stories like somebody came up to me and they told me the Lord said I need to leave my husband. And I'm like, the Lord didn't tell them that. And they were like, but how can you be sure? Because, you know, I, I've been thinking I'm not happy anyway. And so I really feel like that's what God wants me to do. You know how I can be sure? Because his word says that he hates divorce. God will never contradict himself. Now, his word does give provision not for divorce, but for remarriage if you are divorced. His word does give provision, and that's an important distinction there. His word does give you provision in circumstances that when things happen, where you're covered. But God will never tell you to divorce a person you're married to. Circumstances may lead you to a place where you need to step out of that marriage, but that's not God telling you to do that. And I'm being really clear on that because I want you to understand we live in a world where we try. One thing that we say oftentimes as Christians to try to shut other people down when, when, we're, when they're telling us something we don't want to hear is, I really feel like this is where the Lord is leading. I really feel like this is God telling me that. And I'm, Hear me clearly, church. If what you're saying doesn't line up with his word in some way, it's not from him. It's your own flesh convincing you that you need to do something that you just want to do. It's Satan convincing you that you need to do something that he wants you to do. God's word never returns void. All right? I want to be really clear on that. And that's why Paul is saying here, test everything. I don't care how much you trust the person that's saying it to you. Test everything. In Acts chapter 17, where we encounter the church in Thessalonica for the first time, when Paul and Silas, when Jason and the people get Paul and Silas out of town, the next town they go to is a town named Berea. And this church, this town in Berea, it says that when Paul explained to them the message of the gospel, they sought the scriptures for themselves. It's the only church that Paul ministered to that they commend in that way. That they said, even though you're claiming that you were sent from God, we're not just going to take your word for it. We're going to go back and search the scriptures for ourselves to see if this message that you're preaching lines up. And that's what we are called to do as Christ followers. That's why it's so important that you understand how to study God's word for yourself. I love the fact that you guys trust me. I do. I, I love the fact that you trust me to deliver God's word to you on a weekly basis, and I promise you, I put all I can into this to understand his word and to interpret it properly, but I am human, and if you don't know how to study God's word for yourself, I could fall into folly, and you will follow right behind me if I'm the only time you hear God's word. You need to know how to study his word for yourself, because if you stand before God one day and he says, what do you do with my word? You can't stand up there and be like, well, on, on March 30th, Pastor Jay preached about this, and then I did that. No, he wants to know what you did. What did you do with this word? We need to know this for ourselves. And you need to test everything. He says, don't despise prophecies. Don't despise when you're hearing, when you're being corrected by God's word. Don't despise it when, when you have those messages from God, but test it. Test it. And in order for you to test it, you need to know the truth of God's word, which actually jumps into the next one where he says, hold fast what is good. Hold fast what is good, number six. And that what is good is the truth of God's word. It is the good news. It is the gospel. You need to hold fast to that. And again, another phrase we don't use very often. It's kind of an older, an older saying to hold fast to something. It just means to grab a hold of it and not let it go, to hold on to it tightly. Like you got to hold fast. You got to stand firm on it. Hold fast what is good. Grasp the good news, the truth of God's word, and hold on to it tightly. And then the last one that he gives is this, abstain from every form of evil. Number seven, abstain from every form of evil. And this is where I want to challenge us a little bit today. Because I'm not sure that we really abstain from every form of evil. See, I think we have this practice that we like to do, church, if I'm being honest with you. We have this practice of where we like to categorize evils. And we like to say that, hey, these five things, they are really evil. Not going to touch those. These five, eh, they're just semi-evil. So, you know, depending on how the, the wind's blowing that day, maybe. These five, I don't really think these five are, are that bad. So I'm okay with these being in my life where God would say that all 15 of those things are evil. Don't ask me why I use that number. It's not connected to anything. I'm just giving you an example. But we like to categorize these things. 
And what we do when we do that is we start to become the arbiters of who decides what's evil and what's not. But, but we are not the ones who set the standard. God is, and God is holy. And because God is holy, he's the only one who can set the standard. So what we have to decide is if God's word says it's evil, it's evil. And if God's word says it's not evil, it's not evil. What that means for you and me is that lying and drinking too much and eating too much are also evil, and I can't just choose to do them because they feel okay to me, but then hold everybody else accountable who's over here and having sex outside of marriage and doing all this other stuff because that seems extra evil to me. I don't have the right to do that. It says I need to abstain from every form of evil. And so what we have to do is we have to have a proper understanding of what's evil. We only get that by holding fast to the truth. And so when we hold fast to the truth and we can see evil for what it is, we can discern it, we can call it evil, and we can abstain from it. Now, the good news about this, and and hear me clearly on this part, is the good news about this is that you don't have to abstain from it in your own power. In fact, if you tried to, you'd be incapable of it. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What that means is that our flesh, our sin nature, is going to want to pursue things that are evil in the sight of God. And if we try to withstand those things in our own power, we may do pretty well for a little while. But eventually that temptation is going to win over. And we're going to fall prey to it. We're going to give in to it. It's just what happens. There's a story in the book of Samuel about King David. And the passage starts, it starts with, in the time that kings go out to battle. So apparently there was this set time of year where kings would go out and they would fight in these battles. But this one particular time, King David decided to stay back. So I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to watch this fight on Netflix. I'm not going to go out to battle. I'm going to just stay here and chill a little bit. And while he decides to stay at his house instead of going out to do what he was supposed to do, he says, you know what? It's a nice evening. I'm going to go up on the roof. I'm just look around the city, see what's happening. He gets up on the roof of his house. And he sees this lady named Bathsheba who happens to be taking a bath on the roof of her house. Yeah, mm mm-hmm. Yes, she was. And David, when he went up there, what David should have done was like, oh, my bad, and went back in his house. But no, David was like, hey, let me pull up a chair. Let me sit down and watch for a minute. So he does this. He watches. And it says that he found her very attractive. So David calls his boys. Hey, man, I need y'all to do me a favor. I need y'all to run over there and bring Shorty over here. And so his fellas go do it. They go get her, and they bring Bathsheba to the house. Bathsheba was married. She's married to a man named Uriah. Now, Scripture tells us that God is faithful. Scripture says that that you and I will not be tempted beyond what we're able to bear, but God is faithful, and in the temptation, he will make a way of escape so that we're able to bear it. This is how we abstain from evil. God makes a way of escape so that you and I are able to bear this temptation so that when we see this way of escape, we have to make the choice to take it so that we don't let that temptation turn into sin. And I bring this up in the middle of David's story because David has a couple of ways of escape in this moment. So as soon as he heard she's married, way of escape number one, right? Okay, she does look good, but she's married, not mine, can't touch her. Let me go back downstairs, mind my business. If David does that, no harm, no foul, we go on with life. David's like, nope, I don't care. Bring her here. She gets to the house. Scripture words this very, very kindly. It says that her time had just ceased which means that her cycle had just ended. And in their culture, if a person was in that state, they were ceremonially unclean. You could not touch them or you had to go be purified. You had to go to the temple and see the priest and go through a whole purification process or you would be unclean too. So when she gets there and he finds this out, that's a way of escape number two. God gave this man two big open doors to say, you know what, my temptation has me here, but this is something I cannot do. And David's like, nope. Come on, girl. (laughs) And so so scripture says that he lay with her, which there's kids in the room. We won't go any further into that part. But 
And she gets pregnant. And she has a baby. David had two ways of escape. He could have abstained from every form of evil in this, but he chose to ignore the ways of escape. And this is what you and I have to be so cautious with. You are going to be tempted. Scripture says that even Jesus was tempted just as we are, yet without sin. What does that mean? Jesus was tempted, but he saw the picture clearly. He took the ways of escape. He was tempted, and it, Satan was like, hey, I know you're hungry. Turn his bread into a stone. He says, man cannot live by bread alone. What did he do? He quoted God's word. He used Scripture to get him out of those situations. He went back to the truth. He held fast to what was good. You and I have to do the same thing. David had two ways of escape that he chose to ignore. And so he fell into sin. He fell into temptation, which led to sin. So scripture says that Nathan, the God sends Nathan the prophet to talk to King David. Nathan the prophet comes and he tells David this story. He's like, there's this rich man who had a lot of sheep, a lot of lambs. And, and he wanted to sacrifice one for, for some f- party or festival or something. And there was this poor man who had one little lamb that he loved dearly. And the rich man, instead of taking one of his own, he went and took this one little lamb that this one little precious lamb this poor man had. And that's the one that he decided to use for this festival. And scripture says David is infuriated. Like he's mad. Like how could he dare do that? He had all of this stuff over here to himself, and he chose to go take this one little lamb that this other man had. David is infuriated. He's mad, and Nathan looks at him and says, David, you're the man. Sin hits you like a ton of bricks. There's a psalm. I'm not going to read it to you, but I'd encourage you to go read it yourself. Psalm 51. And parts of that psalm, some of you may know, is because David starts talking about creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And, and don't cast me away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. That whole psalm David, is David's prayer in response to his encounter with Nathan the prophet. And I share that part with you to say two things. Number one, God will make a way of escape in your temptation so that you're able to abstain from every form of evil. But to say, number two, that if for some reason you, like David, fall into that sin, fall into that, give into that temptation, you can do what David did in this moment and you can repent. You can turn away from that thing and you can come back to the Father. He will gladly receive you with open arms. But hear me clearly on this. The fact that you have a loving Heavenly Father that will gladly receive you with open arms when you repent does not give you license to live on in sin. All right? If that is how you're thinking, that is not true repentance. You're toying with God in that moment, all right? True repentance is, Lord, I realize I have sinned against you. I've transgressed against you, and I'm going to turn away from this thing, and I'm going to turn, and I'm going to follow you. That's true repentance. It's not let me just keep sinning and keep asking for forgiveness. Parents, if your kids did that to you, eventually what happens? You're about to catch these hands because you know how it goes. So we need to repent if you do fall into sin. But before we ever get there, we look for the ways of escape so that we're able to abstain from every form of evil. Last week, I told you guys that contentment is knowing that Jesus is mine and I am his, and that's more than enough for me. I have a second statement for you on contentment is this. Contentment is knowing God is in control and trusting him with the outcomes. Contentment is me knowing, me realizing, me recognizing, me acknowledging, God, you are totally in control and I trust you with the outcomes. Whether I can see it now, whether I understand it or not, I trust you with the outcomes. And that is how I will be content in the midst of this. That's how I will be able to rejoice always and pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances, knowing that that's your will for me. That's how I will be able to stand and not quench the Holy Spirit and not despise the prophecies, the truth of your word, but I will test what I'm facing against your word. That's how I will be able to stand in that. That's how I will be able to stand and, and stand, hold fast or stand firm on what is good. And that's also how I will be able to abstain from every form of evil. I'll trust you. I'll know that you are God. I will know that you are in control and I will trust you with the outcomes. I love the way the psalmist says this in Psalm 27, 13 through 14. He says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for 
the Lord. And that's my challenge to you today, church. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're enduring, be content in the waiting. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Know that your God is faithful, that he's bigger than anything you may face, and you can wait for him. So I have a couple of reflection questions for you today. Reflection question one, do I wait contently on Jesus? Are you a person who can wait contently on him? And question number two, what is it in me? What is it in me personally that robs me of contentment while I wait on Jesus? Because we all have something in us that robs us of that contentment, whether it's pride or arrogance or, or greed, there's something in us that robs us of contentment in those moments. So Lord, reveal to me what it is in me that robs me of contentment while I wait on you. And then each week we've been doing this Sunday recap where there's something I want you to read throughout this week. This week. I want you to read Psalm 27 every day. It's not a long chapter. Just read Psalm 27 every day and meditate on what it means to seek the Lord while you wait on him. There's a there's actually the whole chapter is beautiful, but there's a few different parts of, of Psalm 27 that I, that I found very impactful. And David at one, or I'm not sure if it's David, I'm sorry, but at one point the psalmist says, one thing have I inquired of the Lord, or one, and that one thing do I seek after. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, that I may see God for who he is, and I may come to him with the things that I have and inquire where he wants me to go. That's how I will wait on him. 1 Thessalonians 5 is the last chapter in, the, in 1 Thessalonians, and Paul closes it out as he often does his letters with just kind of a prayer over the people. And I want to say this prayer over you, church, as a blessing, and then we will pray together. He says in verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He who calls you is faithful. He who has called you Seven Cities Church is faithful. He will surely do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord.